25 years ago, it was for self-evident that to remain true to the values of European humanism, a Nexus Institute had to be founded on the educational ideas of the novel in which had found its supreme expression, the magic mountain of Thomas Mann. Practice the art of conversations. Listening to different, sometimes complete opposing views as no one in advance can claim to be in the position of the truth. Keep alive a book culture and the idea of classics. Cultivate the cosmopolitan spirit of humanism as a counterpoint to both ignorance and fanaticism. So when we started to think about how to celebrate our 25th anniversary, it was perfectly clear that it had to be a symposium about the meaning of all that the magic mountain represents for our time. And when you came into this hall, when you were not too late, you could listen to the prelude to the first act of Wagner's Lohengrin, Green, which was not only Mann's favorite opera, but also the opera that starts with a duel. And the magic mountain centers about a duel between two competing worldviews fighting for the soul of Europe. And with that same duel, we will start today's Nexus Symposium. And I'm delighted that two brave philosophers accepted our invitation to discuss the premises and consequences of each other complete opposite and competing worldviews. And I call them brave because it has become extremely rare that two philosophically opponents really meet eye to eye. Now, as you, those who have read the novel, uh, you know that at the very end of the novel, indeed, there is a physical duel. Nafta is challenging Settembrini, it's a shooting, uh, Settembrini refuses to shoot, and then Nafta kills himself. Um, that fortunately will not happen today. Uh, I double checked, they don't have a gun, they even do not have a fake gun, uh, which they will have here in Amsterdam, no fake guns. Um, so, welcome everybody at today's Magic Mountain. Um, and please do give a very warm welcome to Leo Nafta, also known as Alexander Dugin, and Ludovico Settebrini, also known as Bernard Henri Levy. Thank you. So, first of all, I always prefer the battle of ideas to the physical war. And I am very, very happy that we could exchange with Mr. Uh, Bernard Lévy, who is uh, famous on the world scale, uh, not in the physical duel, because sometimes we are in the same front line, normally on different sides in the physical battle. So I prefer to speak and to, to, to exchange the idea here, not in the physical battle. Maybe it is the only way to avoid that, or at least to try. First of all, I would like to, to, to say that now President Macron recently has said that the, the hegemony of the West is over. The same thing uh, about liberalism or global liberalism has said our president, Mr. Putin. There was recently the issue of foreign affairs with Farid Zakaria article dedicated to the decline of Western power. And I think that it is something we, I'm, I'm, I'm going to discuss. In my eyes, it is almost obvious that there is such decline. Um, in your book, Empire of Five Kings, you have noticed a very interesting thing, a vaporizing of American presence in the Middle East in the case of Kurds. I think that we are approaching the end, not of, to the end of the history, as, uh, as Mr. Fukuyama has said, but the end of political modernity. And that is the end of something very, very important that we should think, uh, and that the end of uh, Western hegemony, of American dominance, or globalism, global liberalism, it is something historical in itself. It's not technical. I interpret that as, for example, in Nietzsche uh, words. So, in the beginning of the modernity, the humans have killed the God. 
in order to liberate. But that was suicide. Killing the God, we have killed ourselves. And now, welcome to the last stage of nihilism. And it's interesting, in your book, you define, Mr. Levy, American empire or global, global liberal system as the system of nihilism based on nothing. It's a very interesting idea, and I would like to ask you uh, why you still defend this more and more open nihilist system, why you fight for this decaying, declining modernity, and why you invest all your intellectual power in order to defend that. Of course, I'm uh, certainly not fighting for nihilism. I'm fighting, on the contrary, to combat nihilism. I'm fighting for political modernity because, in my words, it means democracy, freedom, equality between women and men, secularism, and so on. Political modernity, which is probably in crisis, I refuse the idea of its decline and of its disappearance because I strongly believe that it is a plus for the world. And about nihilism, I read you too since long. Uh, you are my adversary. We think oppositely on many fields, but I recognize your importance especially on the Russian scene. And for me, that's why I read you carefully. For me, the embodiment of nihilism today is you and your friends and the Eurasian um, uh, current and this morbid atmosphere which fills your books and the way in which you dissolve the very idea of human rights, of personal freedoms, of singularities in some big blocks of community, uh, big faith, uh, sacred uh, um, origins, or, or so on. There is a perfume of nihilism that really embarrasses me when I read your Révolution Conservatrice your, uh, uh, and all your works about Eurasia since the beginning of the 90s. So, but uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> if you make a kind of identity between nihilism and refuse to the Western interpretation of human rights, freedom, and democracy, liberal democracy, so in that sense, I agree, I am against that, because for me, uh, it is not they are not universal values, first of all. I think that democracy, the content of democracy, is changing. I have spoken once with Fukuyama, and Fukuyama de de defined the modern understanding of liberal democracy as the rule of the minorities, against the majority, because majority can always uh, transform in the populism and fascism or communism. So that is completely new idea, I think. And I think that if I don't share this new understanding of liberal democracy, or if, for example, I challenge that the subject of the freedom should be individual, and that is the essence, the axis of human rights ideology, if I consider the identity of, of the man, of human culture, of society, not to be reducible to individuality, so, for example, in our Russian tradition, the subject of freedom or the subject, human subject, is not individual. It is collective. 
And that was in, in, the, in the time of Tsars, that was uh, defined by church, after that by communism, but always collective identity was dominant in our culture, as well as in China, in this culture, in Indian culture, uh, up to the same level in the Islamic culture. But I think that I am nihil nihilist in the sense that I refuse universality of the modern Western value. I don't think they are universal. I think they are uh, Western, they are modern. Uh, I think the uh, West is very powerful still uh, in order to defend them. But I just challenge um, that that is the only way to interpret democracy as the rule of minorities against majority. The only way to interpret the freedom as individual freedom, the only way to, inter uh, to interpret human rights projecting Western, modern, individualistic version of human on the other culture. That's my opinion. You know your tradition, the Russian tradition, better than me, but I'm enough a friend of Russia to know that what you said about the place of subjectivity in Russian tradition is not true. You have also a tradition of Erzen, of uh, Pushkin, of Turgenev, a part of Sakharov, all the glorious tradition of the dissidents who fought the totalitarianism of the Soviet Union, who fought in the name of individuality, rights of the subjects, and human rights. And this element, you cannot say that it is not part of the Russian Tradition. And again, you know, I devoted such a big part of my life to defend Russia against slavery, totalitarianism, and so on, to be authorized to say that. Democracy, Fukuyama, I was not here during your debate with Fukuyama, but I suppose what I would say, at least myself, is that democracy is a complex concept and a complex process. It is the rule of the majority and the rule of the, of the minority also and the rule of parliament. It is a very complex architecture which involves, which, evolu which, which knows evolutions throughout time, which enriches itself and the difference between democracy and all sorts of authoritarianism including the one of Putin in Russia today, is that democracy is always open, and always open to change, always open to progress, always open to enrichments, or withdrawals, all of that. And about nihilism, let's agree on one point. You speak of Nietzsche, uh, who did not say that man killed the gods, by the way, but God, which is a very different thing. But the best definition of nihilism for me, we know it. We have it in our memory. Russia, with his 24 millions of deaths during the Great Patriotic War, us in Europe, occupied by the Nazism, the Jews, my people, nearly exterminated. There is one definition of nihilism, which is those who committed these crimes, which means the Nazis. And the Nazis means they did not come from the sky, from the sky of Thule or of Tibet. They came from ideologists, from Carl Schmitt, from uh, uh, from uh, Spengler, from uh, Stuart Chamberlain, from Karl Haushaufer, all people which I'm, I'm sorry to know, to see that you like and you quote and you inspire yourself of their works. So for me, when I say that you are a nihilist, when I say that Putin is a nihilist, when I say that there is in Moscow a morbid atmosphere of nihilism, which creates, by the way, some real deaths, Anna Politovskaya, 
Mr. Nemtsov uh, and, and so many others killed in Moscow uh, or in London every day. I mean it. And I mean that, alas, for this great Russian civilization today, there is a bad, dark wind of nihilism in its proper sense, which is a Nazi and the fascist sense which is blowing on this great Russia. I agree. I think that phenomenon of fascism and national socialism, uh, it, I agree, it is nihilism. I agree, and I don't defend that, because it is modern phenomenon. In my eyes, all modernity is purely nihilist, and liberalism is uh, nihilist, Communism is nihilism and fascism as well. And I think that I agree with you about the crimes committed by Hitler because my people as well suffered a lot. We have lost many, many millions of the people killed because they were Slavs as exactly on the same scale as they were Jews. And our people, Soviet people, Russian people, fought this patriotic war in order to, to, to stop the fascism in Europe, in Russia, and as well to save all the peoples suffered, suffering in that situation. And I strongly blame the all kind of racism. So if I find something interesting, uh, interesting in Heidegger and uh, uh, Schmidt in uh, conservative revolution uh, in Germany, it is, the points of some political realism, on some geopolitical thought, on some um, uh, traditionalism, and the criticism of modernity that was proper to this conservative movement, but not the racist. I always, in all my books, uh, I always stress, and if we, I am bold enough, if I would fascist or racism, to recognize that. I, I, am, I am making many, many bold statements. I am blamed for them. I am against liberalism, against individualism, against human rights as ideology, but I am against racism too. And that is clear. I, I, don't, uh, I don't defend that. Uh, but uh, I don't think uh, racism, I blame, because it is Anglo-Saxon liberal construction based on the hierarchy between the people. I think this criminal. And I think that the same crime now, the globalism repeats, because the, what um, globalists, the liberals, uh, as yourself and the people uh, who support your ideas, now try to uh, affirm as universal values, are simply modern Western liberal values. And that is a kind of new kind of racism, cultural, civilizational racism. You say, you affirm, everybody who accepts open society, they are good guys. All who challenge the open society, they are, as Popper in the subtitle of his book says, they are, are enemies of, uh, of open society. So there's a new Manichaean division that new racism, who is in favor of Western values, they are good. Everybody who challenged that in Islamic tradition, in Russian tradition, in Chinese tradition, in India tradition, in uh, everywhere, they are populist and they are classified as uh, fascism. I think that is new, new racism. Oh, my dear. There is really three real, real points of disagreement. First of all, I'm sorry, but when you speak of globalization, you have a short idea of it. Globalization does not mean there is a bad globalization, of course, which means uniformization of the world. But globalization, as a lot of Western thinkers uh, conceive it, like, as I conceive it, like many people here in Amsterdam conceive it, means not a uniformity, means an openness to the other, means some bridges between civilization, means some nexus between cultures, means some importation, exportation of words, theorems, and so on. This is what globalization can mean too. And believe me, we are very numerous in the West to 
a battle for that. Number two, when you say that, uh, uh, that um, uh, to believe in universal values is a new form of totalitarianism and so on, I'm sorry, but this is so short. The real point is that in every civilization, there are some great things which have been invented. Your civilization, the Russian one, which is a proper civilization, great, which I revere and respect, invented, for example, through Alexander Solzhenitsyn, one of my masters, invented the very idea of the fight against totalitarianism. It's huge what Solzhenitsyn did, and nobody will steal that hugeness from Russian culture. So many Western thinkers tried to think freedom against totalitarianism, what it is, what is a camp, and so on. It belongs to a Russian man to have produced this masterpiece, which was the Archipelago of Gulag. Nothing, nobody will uh, 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 take that from Russian civilization. On the same sense, Europe invented a few things also, which are gains for humanity. For example, equal rights between women and men. For example, the right for a body not to be tortured, not to be enchained or enslaved. This right has been invented, has been produced by a philosophy which has been called the philosophy of enlightenment and which birthplace was Europe. So the idea is not to impose a pattern on another one, it is to take in every civilization the good for the rest of humanity that it invented. And about, I'm happy to, to hear that you don't like racism, but I'm not so sure that you are sincere. I read a few days ago a book of you called uh, La Révolution Conservatrice in French, page 256 and 56, where you spoke about Jews. I'm not only concerned about Jews, I'm concerned about all, but this one was about Jews and about the metaphysical rivalry and war between Aryans, Aryan, and Jews. And you said that this was a challenge, that this was a debate of the, not of the century, but of the time. This is anti-Semitism. And I'm not surprised because all the men which you quoted and from which you draw your inspiration, uh, Spengler, uh, Heidegger, who is also a great philosopher, of course, uh, and others, they are contaminated, corrupted, infected by this plague, which is anti-Semitism. And alas, you too. And in your, in your debates with uh, uh, Alain de Benoit in France, uh, uh, with your connections with Alain Soral, who uh, prefaced one of your books and who is one of the, alas, of the leaders of the French anti-Semitism, all of this perspires. So how can you say that racism is foreign to you? So absolutely foreign uh, to me. Uh, I... Uh, as well, I think that I believe that people uh, have their angels, uh, the people have their archetypes. So the peoples are not only collective of uh, bodies or physical presence, but the people have soul. And there is the soul of Jewish people that I admire, that I respect. 
I have many friends um, in, the, in, in Israel, in the traditionalist circles of Israel that share my opinion. They are uh, Jews uh, believe, who believe in God. Judaism, uh, and that is the, uh, in the confrontation with you. You have they uh, define yourself as Jew, not believing in a Jewish God. For them, for my friends, it would be a, absolutely anti-Semitic affirmation because the Jews are the people of God, and that is the essence. So, without God, the Jews lose their, their essence, religious mission that plays in the history. But that is important that. There are differences between the people, and I am insisting on the difference between the souls of the people, between the angels of the people, but I am against any kind of hierarchy or racism. I don't say that the Indo-European or Greek or European, South German, Indian, Iranian uh, civilization are better or tradition, better than Semitic or um, Islamic or Judaic. I think they are different. And concerning the uh, globalization process you have described, if it would be so, as you have said, we would have nothing against that. If that is dialogue, uh, when everybody participates, Christian, Muslim, Chinese, defending their set of values, if globalization will be the open and just and really democratic dialogue in order to find the better in all the civilization, nobody would oppose to it, I think. At least myself, I wouldn't oppose. But now it is the Western projection of what Western thinks is good or bad as universal value. Uh, capitalism, market, market economy, human rights ideology, individual freedom, hedonism, technocracy, all these elements of Western historical experience, social experience, are projected on the world scale. And that is called universal. So the West is called universal. I, 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 I am against that. And concerning Solzhenitsyn, I, um, I, fo I follow him as well because he was lavophile. And he fought against communist totalitarianism precisely in favor of Russian people as collective identity. Who, who Solzhenitsyn, Solzhenitsyn. I am against Soviet totalitarianism. I am not in favor. I am not defending communism. I was dissident in the uh, 80s. But I am not pro-liberal uh, dissident as Solzhenitsyn. As Solzhenitsyn, I am anti-liberal. He was very critical, uh, anti-liberal dissident. So I think Herzen, you have mentioned, you have mentioned some name in Russian history. Uh, mostly, uh, most of them uh, were Westerners. So they, could, they were ethnically or culturally Russian, but ideologically they were not Russian. They, they, they didn't follow our tradition. And our tradition uh, uh, was based on completely different anthropology and ontology. And Herzen, interesting, he was Westerner in the youth, uh, and immigration, but he returned after to the very nationalist position. So many, Turgenev not, but uh, Herzen, yes, interesting. So one of the, uh, uh, the, the leader of the Russian Westerners, having experienced uh, the West, the Western culture and immigration, returned as many our dissidents from the, returning from the West with very national nationalist ideas. So I think uh, we, we should carefully, uh, carefully conserve this identity, Jewish, Semitic, Islamic, Russian, European, in different forms and try to find a nexus between them. So avoiding this uh, simplistic version, totalitarianism against uh, democracy. Hannah Arendt, that I admire as well, said that Totalitarianism is modern phenomenon. It is not traditional phenomenon. So if we every, measure everything, democracy, liberalism, or fascism, or, or communist, communist totalitarianism, it's a simplistic version. Uh, I think now we need to, to, to imagine something else, something beyond the modernity. And in that sense, all three political theories, liberalism, communism, and fascism, uh, they are the ideology to overcome to, to, to get beyond them. To, to, um, but as well, there are something interesting in, uh, in some 
communist um, uh, thinker as Gramsci, for example, or uh, some co French communist as Atai uh, or Debor or leftists. You, you are from the left. There are so many interesting um, thinkers. We could not um, make identification, for example, Batai with Gulag. We could not say that uh, Heidegger is the same as Svensson, uh, or all liberals are Hiroshima bombing uh, criminals. So we need to find something sane, or try to, some, to find something sane, but in order to overcome. When... About uh, Judaism, you have to revise a little your uh, information. Uh, Judaism and God, it's a little more complicated like that, that uh, than that. Uh, to be a Jew, uh, of course, it is to have a relationship with God, but uh, it's a relationship which is based on study more than uh, in creed. And that is one of the main difference between Judaism and Christianity, but no, no problem. About Erzen, what you don't uh, seem to understand, and what, is the what was the greatness of Erzen was the ability to go back and forth, to enrich the Western tradition with the Russian tradition and vice versa. This was the greatness of Erzen, of Pushkin, of all the anti-Eurasian, the pro-European uh, uh, Russians of the 19th and of the 20th century. Sakharov, for example, whom I, who is, for me, another great hero of the 20th century. He was, he had a foot in Russia, and he had a, he had a foot in liberalism and democracy. He believed in the two, and he devoted all his life in the task of combining the two. And what I fear when I read you, and what I find when I read you, and all, not only you, all the, the writers of this Eurasian current which is supposed to inspire Putin, and what I, what I find so morbid, so smelling death, and so uh, nihilistic, is the fact of conceiving these civilizations as blocks. Of course, you respect, I know, you respect Islam, you respect uh, Japanese civilization, you respect a Turkish civil civilization, and maybe the Jews. But, okay, but on two conditions, that everyone remains at his place and that there is as little communication between all of them. And this conception of culture, of civilizations, considered as blocks, which are uh, uh, um, closed on themselves, you share it with an American thinker whom you know, and you should have quoted him more than Guy Debord. It is Samuel Huntington. Samuel Huntington, with his idea of clash of civilizations, is matching with uh, the thinkers which you represent today in Russia, with this idea of blocks closed and virtually at war against each other. And when you look at Vladimir Putin today, when you look at what he's saying when he addresses Europe, when he addresses America, when he addresses human rights, and so on, it is a, when he addresses Ukraine, when he aggresses Ukraine in Crimea, it is a, a discourse of war. So, a philosophy of war, civilization conceived as holistic blocks, has as a natural outcome a practice of war which is implemented by Vladimir Putin today. And I really believe that between your Huntington way of thinking and the occupation of Crimea, the 13,000 dead in Ukraine, the war in Syria with this bloodbath, tragic and horrible, 
there is a link between the two. I agree. I agree. Uh, I appreciate very much Huntington. Uh, I think his, um, his vision is much more correct than Fukuyama or liberalism, that civilization exists, and after the fall of these two ideological camps, communism against capitalism, the civilization will play a decisive role in the history. I uh, don't think, in Huntington, I agree as well, there is a kind of simplistic vision of civilization. I have dedicated my last uh, 24 books to the study of civilizations, trying to find the differences inside of them. So, trying to to uh, describe them I'm not speaking in a complex differences. way. I'm speaking about bridges. Differences we all know, but did you devote as many books to find some bridges, some connections? Difference I know, bridges. Yes, yes, yes. interesting. So when we try... For sure. <laughs> when we try, when we try to exchange, the, uh, to, 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 to build the bridges too early, without knowing the structure of the other. The problem is the other. The West don't understand the other as something positive. It's all the same, and we immediately try to find the bridges. They are illusions and not the bridges, because we are projecting ourselves. It is the same, the ideology of the same. Otherness, we need first to understand. 24 books dedicated to understand the other than ourselves, than the West, than Islamic, Jewish, uh, European, Russian, uh, 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 thought considered to, to, to something that is known. I think that civilizations are unknown, unknown actors. They are only they are emerging now, and we need to study them first correctly, and after that to create the bridges. Do, do you come often to America? Do you come often to United States? From time to time. Now I'm sanctions, but uh, under sanctions. But okay, and because to, to I, I, I hope I you will be allowed to, to go back. You, you would discover in the American universities, nothing is more um, uh, uh, active than these departments of studies of the otherness. This is one, by the way, America has a lot of defects, a lot of problems, but one of the greatness of America today, and since long, but today more than ever, is this attention to the otherness, is this a uh, 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 very uh, insightful uh, look in the, in the body and in the soul of all foreign cultures. You cannot imagine how vivid, vibrant, open to the other are the American universities, and sometimes also the French universities. So, knowledge of the otherness we have in the West. Unfortunately, opening our arms, our hearts, uh, and your arms and your hearts to the otherness, not enough. Now you said I'm right. Okay, one question. What do you think about the um, aggression of your country? M me, when France aggressed uh, 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 Algeria when I was a boy, I was 14 years old, I was in the streets. When America aggressed Vietnam, I was demonstrating. Today, what do you think of the occupation of Crimea? And what do you think of the aggression of uh, Eastern Ukraine by uh, uh, paramilitaries or militaries of your country? You, in your book, you say you deplored that you manifested against Americans. So you can, uh, you, we can change our minds. So um, you, now you def are defending the American empire, the world liberal empire. And that is your option or your choice that I respect. Uh, I think that I defend uh, Eurasian civilization um, as, not as the country. I'm not uh, too much patriot of the Russian Federation and all our government uh, does. I'm not no, uh, automatically support all that. I have critical... C Crimea, opinion. Crimea. So, yeah, I'm, I'm coming, I'm approaching. <laughs> so. Uh, in my opinion, there are, uh, uh, the Ukraine is the country with two people and two civilizations. 
they are ethnically very, very close because it is not Ukrainian people. They're Ukrainian. It is the part of uh, the cradle of Russian civilization. In some way, Ukrainians are more direct uh, parents of us. They, they are pure Russians. They are more pure Russians than ourselves because they live still in the cradle of our tradition, and we migrated to, to the East. So, uh, uh, the, uh, historically, uh, Ukraine was created by two tendency of aggression of uh, Russian empire. Aggression against Turkey, because the uh, new Russia, Novorossiya, was the part of Turkish uh, territories in Crimea and uh, Eastern modern days Ukraine, and the other part was taken from uh, Poland. And that was the, uh, that wasn't uh, uh, liberated or created by Western Russian so-called Ukrainians. So Russia have, has historically, during uh, aggression against the neighbor country, uh, countries, uh, created Ukraine. And the last piece of it was uh, uh, added by Stalin from Austria-Hungary, uh, uh, the uh, Lemberg, Lvov uh, district. So that was composed entity that appeared after the fall of the Soviet Union. And there was the chance to create Ukrainian identity, as for example, there, were, there is Belgium identity with two people living uh, and considering, respecting each other. So there are two people. And if, for example, the Valence would like to say that Flemish, they are a second, uh, second uh, um, type of the, of the uh, subhuman, uh, subhuman, because they are German, for example, or Protestants. That was exactly the same that happened to the Ukraine. The, the state, uh, the newly born state uh, that didn't exist in the history, had the chance to create its national idea, national structure, respecting both people living there, in Eastern Ukraine and the Western Ukraine, and to find a balance. And I supported that, and I have the partisans, including in the Western Ukraine, uh, sharing this view. But finally, politically, that was only the part, Western part, that in Maidan, where you were uh, tr trying to inspire them to, to, to get off from uh, so-called Russia, uh, and that, uh, that part, Western part, has submitted the, the other. Uh, Russia intervened in order to save this part of Ukraine. And after we have committed the error, I think, we should liberate the Eastern Ukraine with Crimea and to propose to recreate Ukraine independent Ukraine as the bridge between us and Europe and basing on the respect of both identities. And that was the mistake that we, we, we have taken only Crimea or, or only Donbass. It was a mistake. We should restore and reconstruct Ukraine when Yanukovych was... Uh, for for the moment, territories. the only bridge which exists, which has been created, is between Crimea and Russia. For the moment, the only uh, building which has been done is a huge military basis in Sebastopol of Russia, uh, directed against uh, uh, enemies, I suppose. And I don't see in the last years, uh, in the speeches of Putin or others, any tendency to rebuild a binational great Ukraine. I see a pure and uh, 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 rabid, rabid aggression uh, and violation of the international law. I see uh, an attempt of rewriting and of revising history. That, by the way, if I understood you well, you are pursuing today. When you say that Ukraine is a new state, uh, this is what I heard, in, how can you say that? Ukraine, that's a point of history, existed before Russia. Yeah, yes. Okay, ah, okay. okay. In that sense, okay, in the this modern is the ninth nine century before uh, uh, year no, that uh, was 1000. This, that the, was the common history. The, the Russ of Kiev, the Prince Volodymyr, who was baptized and who is at the origin of the Christianization of, of modern Ukraine and modern Russia, was a prince of Kiev, not of uh, Moscow. So, yes. 
Ukraine is an old country, uh, 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 more Russia. ancient than Russia. Okay, so, so every country is are new. So the best we can do, Mr. Dugin, the best we can do is to respect as imperfect as they are, the international laws, the laws that might prevent us to, to fall in another catastrophe like the one who costed your people 24, 25 million uh, brave soldiers and civilians destroyed by Hitler and who costed uh, Europe such a ruin. There is an architecture of security, an architecture of security which has been built after the Cold War in cooperation, by the way, between the West and Russia at many steps. And we have to do our best for our children. I don't know if you have children. Yes, yes. Okay. and grandchildren. Grandchildren, yeah. okay, for them. We have to do our best to preserve and to save this unperfect, but decisive and crucial architecture of security. And what Putin did in Crimea, what he's doing at this very minute in Eastern Ukraine, what he's doing when he plays with fire and with massacre and bloodbath in Syria goes against the interests of our children and grandchildren. I don't think so. I agree on the principle that we need some international law, but law reflects the status quo, the, the, the balance of power. The law could not be absolutely abstract. For example, uh, the law is established after the victory, when the West and the Soviet Union were together, we have won over Hitler, we established our international law. When the communism falls and the Soviet Union collapsed, there was attempt to create the Western-centered law based on the victory in the uh, Cold War. And that law now, the international balance of power, is in decay. We are challenging it and we try to create new archi uh, international architecture that would respect civilizations. So I think we are coming to the end of the multiple, uh, unipolar uh, world system and structure based on this ideological and geopolitical victory. Uh, or, or because the end of the unipolar moment, as Charles Krauthammer has said, now we, we have it. It is now. So, civilizations reappear. And we could not put this emergence of civilizations in the old version of Westphalian national state system. Today, we need to revise that in a multipolar way in order to respect the other accepted not only culturally. I agree uh, with you about uh, American universities because I'm admirer of Boas tradition, anthropology on, on his, all his line, uh, Franz Boas and uh, uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. They are, for me, they are masters. I am following their, they my teachers. Uh, this anthropolog uh, anthropological pluralism, I, uh, I agree that that is precisely American and French tradition, but it is not reflected in the politics or reflected in the very, very perverted way. So I think there is big contradiction between the, this anthropological thought in American universities, on French university, and kind of uh, uh, very aggressive colonial and neo-imperialist form to promote American interest on the world scale with, with the weapon. I could not blame only Putin for Syria, for example. Uh, you were active as well in the Libyan crisis that costed to, to, the, to the Libyan people so the, the, uh, the rivers of, of blood. So you su suggested to over overthrow Assad, and that was support of the part in this civil war against the other. So um, um, I think that uh, we could not um, uh, accuse in that situation only uh, Putin. It, it is a perverted image. Putin reacted. Putin, Putin tries to affirm Russian 
voice and China's voice as well in this situation. That is five king against, against empire. You are on the side of, uh, of empire, so you are accused the, on all the crimes the five king. We are five kings. I am, I am on the side of Solzhenitsyn. I am of the side was one of, of, them, of, of Bukowski. Was I am of the side of Anna Politovskaya. I am on the side of Leonid Pliuch. I am on the side of so many of my dead very often and sometimes living Russian friends. I'm on their side too, believe me. The big disagreement about, uh, between us, and we are, uh, cl uh, we are advancing to the end, uh, is uh, the, the following. First of all, multipolarism is not a new thing. There, there has always been multipolarism. Uh, and before the collapse of Soviet Union, <laughs> there was a big multilateralism between America, Russia, China, so, so. it's not such a new thing, number one. Number two, you say that everyone should respect the other one and not interfere in the, the process of the other civilization. If you look honestly at the situation of today, the one who interferes, the one who tries really genuinely to destabilize the other, is not Trump <laughs> destabilizing Russia, it is Putin destabilizing America and Europe. Today, there is not, Mr. Dugin, believe me, I, I know that, uh, and these are facts, and they will be fact-checked. Uh, you cannot find one extreme rightist and neo-fascist party in Europe which is not at least blessed and at best uh, financed by Russia. You cannot find one crisis in Europe which is not encouraged by Russia. You cannot count the number in 2014 and 15 of violation of the Aryan space of Poland, Lithuania, and even sometimes France by Russian um, uh, planes. You know, as I know, in 2014 and 15, the little declaration of Putin, who is a good chess player, saying, that one should revise the legality, en passant, comme ça, just bypassing, the legality of the process of independence of the Baltic states. Another sentence saying that from Russia to Moscow it will take two hours, and so on. So today, the real imperialism, the real one who is interfering and uh, suing some disorder in the, uh, and, uh, and intervening in the affairs of the other one, alas, is Putin. And I'm not speaking, I, I, I should speak of America, where it is now proved that there has been a huge, a crude, and uh, 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 evident intervention in the electoral process of the last election. And uh, last remark, uh, Syria, uh, Libya, and so on. This is, these are not civil, civil wars. Again, civil war is a false concept, and you are too uh, wise to, to make this mistake. It is wars against civilians. Syria, Libya, other places. It is war of a state, of an army. It was in Libya, and it is still in Syria. War against civilians. What is true is that you have people in the West like me, and in Russia also, and in Ukraine, who took part for the civilians in Libya in order to prevent the blood bloodbath, in order to prevent what happens today in Syria, which is 400,000 dead, 3 million displaced people, and so on. That is true, but it has nothing to do, it cannot be compared to what a, a big state, Russia, does with its big planes, with uh, the gas of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, which is uh, to uh, uh, feed the war of aggression of a butcher, Bashar al-Assad, who does not care about our discussion about civilizations, bridges, blocks, and so on, who is just an executioner supported today by your president. 
So I think that so many exaggerations and rhetorics figure that I'm not inclined to, uh, to, to, uh, um, to answer, not because I, I have no answer. For example, about intervention. On one side, it, it was proof that there was no intervention in favor of Trump, and there was intervention in favor of Hillary, of some Russian oligarchs. So uh, the same for um, financement of uh, far-right movement in Europe. There are many rumors, there are many publications, there are many rhetorics or intervention of Russia, most absurd from all of them in the Catalonia crisis, but no proofs. But nevertheless, what is interesting, we are in certain, I, uh, I, I don't like to, to speak about the facts now. About the? About the facts, because the, the I consider the. So you want to speak about what, if not the facts? Facts are something that was done. The fatsere, Latin term, that was deeds, that was construction. In the informational age, we are dealing with informational facts. So who controls the media, as the Bohr, Guy de Bohr has said, control the facts. So if we don't want Re to. Readers and journalists, uh, mostly. Who controls the media? Readers and journalists. A little tycoons, but a lot of readers and journalists. They are who control the the, controllers of media. The media. At least in the West. This is one of the advantages of the West. It is a kind of European we have, version. We have a discussion in France today about Le Monde, which is the biggest newspaper. And there, is, you know, and there is a project of the owners of Le Monde to bring their shares to a foundation mm -hmm. which will belong to public interest. So Le Monde will belong, this is the good of westernization, will belong to its readers and to its journalists. Uh, they're not, we are speaking not about the owner, uh, mm. we are speaking about epistemology and the Foucault, ah. Michel Foucault concept, who control epistemology. The mass media, for example, Régis Debré has said, being the advisor of Mitterrand, he could not achieve no plan with a support of president because of some resistance going from nowhere. So there are some epistemological center of control. They are not owner of media. Interesting that this is an epistemological struggle. So one, we have one created system of fact or chosen fact, biased fact, and uh, explained by, uh, in a biased way. And when Russia tried to do the same, to create our uh, mass media, Russia Today, Sputnik, we are blamed to, to, to have the, the uh, fake news. I, to say the truth, we both are producing I, I fake news. Why. I tell you why. Rhetoric. The, big, the big difference is that when uh, Russia Today is invented, it is invented by verticality. Democracy vertical, as you say in yourself. It is, it is, it is founded by Putin. When you have a conflict of interpretation in the West between Le Monde and Le Figaro, between the New York Times and, uh, the, uh, and the Crying Science Monitor or, or, or whatever, it is a fight between uh, professionals individuals, it is a, a, an, a, a sincere attempt to find the truth. It is not a propaganda media coming from the sky of power. And this again Mr. is an advantage of saying? the West. Because what is true, my dear Dugin, what is true is that we are out of the age where truth uh, comes from, from the sky, like in Pla Plateau. I'm it has to be searched. And it has to be searched with sincerity and genuineness. For that, we don't need the intervention of the state. We don't need the trolls manipulated by uh, the Kremlin or by uh, White House if they did it. We need, again, uh, some uh, uh, readers, uh, some journalists, uh, civil society, all animated by a sincere and authentic will for truth, to speak like Frédéric Nietzsche. This image uh, is so beautiful that I but could I not, recommend that not to so, Russia. So, uh, I recommend that to Russia. It is one of the beauties that democracy can offer to Russia. And when you embrace it, it will not be Western. 
It will be a common good, and it will be Russian too. Bush, when Bush uh, was uh, in Moscow and the moment of invasion of United States uh, in Iraq, he had said, uh, please keep, uh, um, be patient. You will have democracy as well as in Iraq. Uh, Putin has said, thank you very much. We, we will find the other way uh, to, the, to, to build our society. I think that uh, the, the picture you've made is correct, but that has nothing to do with modern Western society, where it's purely totalitarian way to, to, to this, uh, this of the fact description not in, in the favor of small group of holder of one uh, mass media or other, but a, a political elite rules. And they are, in that sense, a kind of Platonist, taking their truth from their liberal ideology. That is something Platonic as well. And the people are in the revolt against that in, uh, in our, our different countries, but as well in the West. I think the wave of populism, it is precisely the refusal of the European people, not right wing or left wing, refusal, normal, normal middle, uh, middle European citizens that is refused of this absolutely abstract agenda of liberal elites. So I think that is not about state now. We are speaking about political elites. Okay, there is this, uh, you are a good observer, this happens in the West. But more generally, there is a big fight all over the world between liberal values and illiberal values. This fight crosses our countries too. You have some liberal in Russia, and we have some illiberals in uh, 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 Europe. And what is true is that liberalism faces the same sort of crisis of credibility and maybe of self-credibility as it faced in the 30s or at the very beginning of the 20th century. But in this fight, Mr. Dugin, I, I check today, we are at the end of this debate, that we will be on the two sides of the barricade because yeah. I will, for me, a free press is not totalitarianism. The cult or the respect of liberal ideas and of freedom is not another liberalism. Secularism, rights of women, cannot be placed as you did at the beginning of our encounter at the same level than fascism and communism. There is today a real clash of civilization but not the one you are quoting in your books between the North and the East and the West and the South and all of that. There is a clash of civilization all over the planet between those who believe in human rights, in liberty, in the right for a body not to be tortured and martyred, and those who are happy with illiberalism and revival of authoritarianism and slavery. And this is what, is what makes the difference between you, between you and me. I'm sorry to have checked it today again.